So with that, good evening, sisters and brothers. Um, as has been said, my name is Harris Damon, and I'm a volunteer with RCCI, the ministry of uh, the Emmanuel Gospel Center that's sponsored this forum series. And before beginning, I want to give honor to God, of course, mm -hmm. for this opportunity to share with you from my heart on this topic of liberation theology. Um, to Megan Leeds and Allison King, who have co-labored with me and envisioned this night, to Professor Mich Michelle Sanchez of HDS, who pushed me to use my theological imagination in writing this lecture, and to my fiance, who's here tonight, who is my fiercest and most unconditional supporter. So, uh, this lecture is inspired in large part by the underappreciated genius of James Cone and my desire to contribute to the correction of the undervaluing of his thought. You see, even as the main point of this lecture is to demonstrate the importance of reading the Bible from the margins, that is, reading through the lens of liberation theology, I simply cannot do so without first introducing you to James Cone. Just as we give honor to the church fathers and mothers who have guided the people of God through the last 2,000 years of church history, and open our eyes to the Trinity, faith-based justification, the continued work of the Holy Spirit, and the importance of women in spiritual leadership positions, I offer to you that James Cone offered a similarly, similarly significant paradigm shift that has echoed for the last 50 years, that our God in Jesus Christ is the God of the oppressed. Uh, it is the title of one of his most famous books, and indeed, what I will try to do tonight is to explain the imperative of reading the Bible from the margins, specifically through the voice, the story, and thought of James Cone in that volume. Cone being the widely recognized father of black liberation theology. Before we get started, you should understand that I will not be making an exegetical argument tonight, but rather a theological argument for reading the Bible from the margins. Put another way, um, Rather than critically analyzing and breaking down a specific passage of scripture to make this case, we'll use what we know about the nature of God from scripture to map out a blueprint for the proper reading of scripture. This is based on the premise that any reading of scripture should map onto or be in accordance with the lived example of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. I'll say that again. Any reading of scripture should map onto the lived example of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. Why might you ask? J. Cameron Carter says it this way, quote, there is no accessing the divine apart from its revelation and thus mediation in the materiality of creation and the flesh, end quote. We'll see this more clearly as we move through this lecture. Stay with me even as we pass over a few technical terms here and there. I promise that we'll all get to a shared understanding of the thesis of this argument for reading the Bible from the margins. From there, we can dive into questions and discussion. Does that sound all right? Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. 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 I'm in. Good. As will be shown in this lecture with great help from his 1975 book, God and the Oppressed, the depth of James Cone's thought is on par with and perhaps even more imaginative and theologically rich than the thought of those theologians who are most revered in the academy and church. Indeed, having studied Cone alongside John Calvin, Friedrich Schleiermacher, and Karl Barth, I am persuaded that the reflections of Cone are as needed for Christian theological formation as theirs. Why then has Cone not been considered as important to Christian thought as those just mentioned? I would offer that my own biases coming into this research are telling. Even before reading God of the Oppressed, especially as a black student of theology, I knew who James Cone was, at least enough to know that he was the father of <coughs> liberation theology and black theology, and to recognize his ability to richly relate the black experience to the experience of Christ. To me, however, that James Cone was a proponent of black liberation theology meant that he had elevated his blackness too far. Indeed, though I also live under the oppression known to all black persons in America, my understanding of myself as Christian before black gave me pause when considering James Cone's thought. 
I could see no need for an adjective in front of Christian theology because of the universality and the transcendence of God through Jesus Christ. So I relegated James Cone to the category of theologians who had forgotten or purposefully abandoned the primacy of Jesus Christ and his universal good news to every person. That is, I understood James Cohen to have good news only for black people and to have nothing good or salvific to say to the rest of the world, not least to my white brothers and sisters. Cohen thought, even while reading God of the Oppressed, frequently seemed insufficiently universal to me, even as a black man who yearns for liberation. As Cohen himself makes clear, any apparent lack of universality in his thought is not something he concerns himself with very much. His message is a message of liberation for black people and the comfort of white people or any other person, such as a black man concerned with universality. With the framing, radicalism, and the rhetoric of his message is not a priority in the least. In God of the Oppressed, he writes, quote, Black theologians are not called to interpret the gospel in a form acceptable to white oppressors. Our task is to interpret the struggle of oppressed people in the light of God's presence with them, liberating and thus reconciling the oppressed to themselves and to God. End quote. Earlier in the book, Cohen writes, quote, from God's side, reconciliation between blacks and whites means that God is unquestionably on the side of the oppressed blacks struggling for justice. As jarring as this may sound to the ears of those accustomed to polite Christian discussion, one must not hear Cohen as affirming the non-universality of the gospel, nor as affirming the idea that Jesus Christ is only good news for black people. Rather, Cohen affirms the unimportance of white fragility. Amen. In his project, that is instead primarily an offering of a message of hope and truth to black people who have been denied it by white Christian theology. Indeed, as we delve into the liberation theology of Cohn, it is my contention that white fragility has obscured the genius of Cohn's thought and kept it from being as lauded and esteemed as that of Calvin, Schleiermacher, and Barth, and has kept God of the Oppressed, among Cohn's other works, from being counted as a foundational text for Christian theological and ministerial formation. Indeed, white fragility, and I defined it here. Oh, can you guys see behind my head? <laughs> Perhaps white fragility within black thinkers as well has caused Cone to be disregarded as too particularistic, <clears throat> even while Cone's theological imagination offers profound revelation regarding the dialectical or sim simultaneously contradictory and interrelated relationship between the universal and particular <coughs> dimensions of God. Don't worry if those terms don't make sense yet. We'll explore them in depth during our time together. What the Christian Academy and Church have missed as a result of their white fragility is a simple notion that, even while he directs his message to oppressed black peoples, Cone's theology is both highly particular and highly universal. In other words, I want to demonstrate to you tonight how we have misunderstood and misconstrued the message of James Cone and black liberation theology as only speaking to black people. While Cone may speak to black people first, he also speaks a message that all Christians must hear. So let's now dive into the meat of this argument. From the introduction of God of the Oppressed, James Cohn makes it clear that he is interested in what I refer to in this lecture as the universal particular dialectic. That is, the binary that describes the simultaneous <coughs> distinction and interrelation of transcendence, meaning eternity and history, respectively. Don't worry, got a slide for you. <laughs> move this over. You may want to move over by your computer. That's a, that's a good point. <laughs> I don't know if I can Just do both over there. Move, 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 move. Oh, I'll try this. Okay. So, this is a universal particular dialectic. Universal, we're thinking about transcendence the spiritual nature of God, things like eternity and heaven, God the Father, the all-powerfulness, the all-knowing qualities of God. And when we think about the particular, when I say that, I'm talking about Jesus. Mm 
I'm talking about imminence, concreteness, him being a Palestinian Jew like Megan was talking about in history, and him being a human. The Christian God, God in Jesus Christ, is somewhere in between these two. It's, a, it's what theologians call a hypostatic union. But this, God's in the middle. Truth, if God is truth, truth is also in the middle. So when we're thinking about truth, and, and we'll go through this, you, you can't um, prioritize one of these over the other when you're thinking about God. You can't absolutize it, as we'd say. So this is the dialectic that we're going to be exploring, and we'll see how this will affect us practically later in the, this lecture. In Cohn's volume and in this lecture, this discussion of the dialectic usually concerns the universality and particularity of the gospel of Jesus Christ, with universality, as I said, often denoting the truth of this gospel for both blacks and whites, or of all humankind. And with particularity often denoted in truth of this gospel as being primarily attentive to the liberation of American blacks or all oppressed peoples. The theological framework that Cohn presents in God the Oppressed is explicitly one that does not prioritize the particular nor the universal over the other. The truth and nature of God is found somewhere in the in-between. So let's talk about the universal. After making his after making clear his dual interest in both the universal and the particular, and in their dialectical relationship, at the same time distinct but also related, God the Father and Jesus at the same time, Cone's first order of business is to deconstruct and to reimagine the notion of the universal because of the notion of the universal has been so greatly abused by white theologians. Mm -hmm. First, Cohn uses support from H. Richard Neal to explain that universality is a divine quality that is not fully accessible to humanity. Quote, though we direct our thought to eternal and transcendent beings, it is not eternal and transcendent. Though we regard the universal, the image of the universal in our mind is not a universal image. It is a finite image, limited by the temporality and particularity of our existence. Theology is not universal language. Theology is not universal language. It is interested language, and thus is always a reflection of the goals and aspirations of a particular people in a definite social setting. In other words, theology, or our understanding of God, is not separable from our own individual and collective biases. <coughs> no one can claim that their understanding of God is pure and unshaped by their human experiences. All of us see God and understand him, even after reading scripture, in part. This is important. Our understanding of God cannot fully grasp his universality. Indeed, our minds cannot comprehend it. Second, continuing from the understanding that human thought cannot fully access the universal, Cohn argues that such a proposition necessitates humility. Believers must, quote, confess their limitations, their inability to say anything about God, which is not at the same time a statement about the social context of their own existence. Furthermore, Cohn argues that white theologians' insistence that the gospel retain its universality above all else that is, their insistence on a gospel message that does not easily or at all admit the social dimension of every attempt to describe the universal, to describe God. A gospel message that is not at all concerned with particularity is itself a socially interested denying of the particularity of Jesus Christ within the gospel story, which then permits them to believe that they can ignore the particular relevance, relevance Relevant, sorry, <laughs> of the gospel today for oppressed blacks in America. I'll say that again because I was messing that up for you guys. Every attempt to describe the universal, a gospel message that is not concerned with particularity, is itself a socially interested denying of the particularity of Jesus Christ within the gospel story, which then permits them to believe that they can ignore the particular relevance 
of the gospel today for oppressed blacks in America. Cohen writes, quote, as long as they can be sure that the gospel is for everybody, ignoring that God liberated a particular people from Egypt, came in a particular man named Jesus, and for the particular purpose of liberating the oppressed, then they can continue to lecture in theological abstractions. <laughs> failing to recognize that such lecture is not the gospel unless it is related to the concrete freedom of the little ones. End quote. Let's talk about the particular now. Cohn's reimagination of the universal as described above may be unsettling for those whose Christian formation is inflected by the depoliticized ethos of Western Christianity. Mm -hmm. Sounds like we have some people who are acquainted with that depoliticizing <laughs> us. I am. A deeply abstract and philosophical tradition, which can be traced back to the reformers, and even further back to the Constantinian Empire, when Christianity was distorted into a religion that prized Roman state power instead of a religion that prized the powerless. Cohn describes the ethical orientation of Western Christianity as given towards maintaining the status quo, even as, quote, God's revelation was interpreted more often than not as consistent with the values of the structures of oppression, end quote. Let me repeat that. For Cohn, the status quo ethic of Western Christianity has allowed it to be more focused on its flawed notion of the universal, a focus that was initially influenced by Greek philosophy the valorization of reason, and a desire to not rock the political boat so as to continue receiving special favors from the Roman state, then to be focused on the predominant biblical theme of liberation. This status, status quo ethic still marks Christian theology, which is one reason that Cohn's black liberation theology has been so widely rejected by white theologians. The importance of this defective notion of the universal is by now quite fundamental to Western Christian tradition, and it is therefore difficult to disabuse. Mm. If we are able, however, to step out of the confines of a theology beholden to the historical and socioeconomic project of whiteness, <clears throat> we might ask, how is a diverse community that makes up the Christian world supposed to have a common understanding of the saving power of Jesus Christ and the essence of his gospel message if our different social locations prevent us from espousing a universal truth of Christ mm. for all people. This is where the particular aspect of the universal particular dialectic becomes instructive. As described earlier, while the notion of the universal is concerned with the eternal and transcendent qualities of God and that of the gospel message of Jesus Christ, the particular truth of the gospel is concerned with the imminence and the concreteness of God in history. In other words, Jesus Christ is both universally salvific and particularly significant and salvific, as demonstrated by his concrete actions in history. Cohn writes this, The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of Peter, James, and John, is not an eternal idea. And neither is the divine and absolute ethical principle to whom God ought to appeal for the knowledge of the good. Rather, Yahweh is known and worshipped as the one who brought Israel out of Egypt and who raised Jesus from the dead. God is the political God, the protector of the poor, and the establisher of the right for those who are oppressed. To know God is to experience the acts of God in the concrete affairs and relationships of people, liberating the weak and the helpless from pain and humiliation. Indeed, the testimony of the Bible in the Old and New Testaments is that God is given to the concrete and historical liberation of his people. This is God's tendency, it's his desire, and it's his unchanging orientation. This is all to say that God is a particular God, a God that cannot be trivialized as a disinterested spirit being, only concerned with the orchestration of human history from a universal bird's eye view. A lot of time in our churches, we think that to know God is 
to know the major tenets of Calvinism or Arminianism. <laughs> or that we know God if we believe the right theology and have our understanding of what is sin buttoned up and we don't struggle with doubt. But we misunderstand the testimony of the Bible if we forget that God retains his universal sovereignty and salvific power <clears throat> even while entering particular human histories. That of the Israelites in the Old Testament, that of those receiving exorcism from Jesus in the New Testament, and finally, that of any person who enters divine freedom by following after Christ with all concreteness and imminence to liberate them from oppression and suffering. From this discussion of the particularity of God, then, it is clear that although we cannot claim to have a grasp of the universal truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we discussed earlier, it is possible to grasp the particular truth of Christ through the experience of his concrete actions in history, all of which point to his propensity to liberate the oppressed from their suffering. In other words, although the various loca social locations within our human experiences prevent us from claiming full knowledge of universal truth, the entering of God into actual social locations within the stories of the Old and New Testaments allow us to discern a critical pattern of liberation in the particularity of God. Over and over again, we see that God's continual work is liberation. Indeed, this is why Cohn can write, quote, any starting point in Christian theology that ignores God in Christ as the liberator of the oppressed, or that makes salvation as liberation secondary, is ipso facto invalid and thus heretical. Mm -hmm. I'm sure this next slide. Back to the particular. What's so powerful about this reflection on the stories that so many of us learned in Sunday school? is that unlike the universal aspect of his nature, we can grasp the particular liberatory aspect of God's nature. Mm -hmm. We know what God holds true when he shows up in the Gospels. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. We understand more about the ultimate reality of God through our observation and experience of his particular acts in the Gospels and in our lives today. Furthermore, because we can fully grasp this particular truth of God, and because it is our primary frame of revelation, it is imperative that our understanding of the universal truth of God align with it. As I said before, any reading of scripture should map onto the lived example of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. Our litmus test for Christian theology then, folks, is the lived example of Jesus the Liberator. Our understanding of the universal is limited. Our understanding of the particular is less limited. And therefore, revelation moves this way. The particular helps us understand the universal. Jesus helps us understand God. One theologian said, Jesus is the exegesis, the, the best interpretation of God. And that's why scripture reading has to come through the lens of Christ. If a scripture doesn't map onto the lived example of Jesus, the liberator, you're not reading it right. So where does this leave us? Given then that the universal particular dialectic both demonstrates the fundamental liberation-oriented nature of God and compels Christian to understand God first through his particularity, that is, through his concrete actions to liberate oppressed peoples in history, it is clear that believing in the story of Jesus means that contemporary Christians must, quote, investigate the connection between Jesus' words and deeds in the first century Palestine in our existence today, end quote. For Cohn, quote, truth is more than the retelling of the biblical story. Truth is the divine happening that invades our contemporary situation, revealing the meaning of the past for the present so that we are made new creatures for the future. Indeed, it is through this evaluation that the necessity of black liberation theology becomes clear. More than a set of statements based on the stories of the Bible which can simply be affirmed, truth is the moment of divine intervention within our own historical situation, wherein God liberates the oppressed and poor 
Truth is the meeting of the universal in the particular today. The in-between of the universal particular dialectic right now. Truth compels Christians to ask with James Cone, who is Jesus Christ for us today? For Cone, the answer to this question is simple. Jesus is black. Amen. This statement is Cone's analog to Nietzsche's God is dead. <laughs> for it is his most famous and controversial within the Christian academy and the church. Indeed, he anticipates the uncritical dismissal of the recognition of Jesus' blackness, attributing most of this negative reaction to the inability of white theologians to, quote, relate positively to anything black, end quote. Even with a critical lens not clouded by the historical and socioeconomic project of whiteness, however, one might wonder, how can Jesus be black if he was a Jew, according to the Bible? This question is one that Cohen is willing to engage, considering that, quote, the substance of the black Christ issue can only be dealt with on theological grounds, end quote. He explains that, quote, Jesus is black because he was a Jew. I missed this letter here, guys. There we are. That is, for Cohen, the universal particular dialectic and the corresponding biblical ethic of liberation requires that Christians understand that Jesus is black because by coming to earth in Jewish flesh in order to become the, quote, fulfillment of God's covenant with Israel, end quote, Jesus revealed the divine willingness to suffer in order that humanity might be fully liberated. The liberating truth and power of Christ is made manifest through his literally taking the place of those who are oppressed and suffering by his truly entering the historical situation. This is why it is right for Cohn to ask, quote, is it not true that Christ must be black in order to remain faithful to the divine promise to bear the suffering of the poor? Mm -hmm. End quote. Indeed, Cohn is at the apex of his Christological genius in explaining the blackness of Jesus Christ. Watch this, end quote. End quote. Christ's blackness is the American expression of the truth of his parable about the last judgment. Truly I say to you, as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. Matthew 25, 45. The least in America are literally and symbolically present in black people. To say that Christ is black means that black people are God's poor people who Christ has come to liberate. Christ is black, therefore, not because of some cultural or psychological need of black people. But because, and only because, Christ really enters into our world where the poor, the despised, and the black are, disclosing that he is with them, enduring their humiliation and pain, and transforming oppressed slaves into liberated servants. Indeed, if Christ is not truly black, then the historical Jesus lied. End quote. Finally, with the blackness of Jesus Christ now in clear view, one can easily understand the necessity of a theology of black liberation. The gospel of Jesus Christ in America is aimed at the liberation of, of the oppressed blacks who suffer under white supremacist policies and practices. Indeed, for Cone, quote, since the people of color are God's elected poor in America, any interpretation of God in the American context, I'll add, that ignores black oppression cannot be Christian theology say that again. Since the people of color are God's elected for in America, any interpretation of God in the American context that ignores black oppression cannot be Christian theology. So then, having repurposed arguments of James Cone in an attempt to make the case for black liberation theology in such a way that white dismissal of black Jesus would have to be attributable, attributable to fragile white racism and not due to any valid interpretive disagreement with regard to the scriptures. I'll wrap up this lecture by discussing the ramifications of Christ's blackness for our understanding of God and his word. First, it must be clear that the universal particular dialectic that Cohen explicates in God of the Oppressed authorizes a black liberation theology, but not only a black liberation theology. That is, the universal particular dialectic authorizes many different liberation theologies, each for their own historical situation 
as entered into by God in Jesus Christ. To this point, Cohn writes, quote, I realize that blackness as a Christological title or descriptor of Christ a definition here, may not be appropriate in the distant future or in, even in every human context in our present. But the validity of any Christological title in any period of history is not decided by its universality, but by this, whether in the particularity of its time, it points to God's universal will to liberate particular oppressed people from inhumanity. End quote. Moving forward from this explanation, Vincent Lloyd, a scholar of race and theology, is helpful in understanding that taking black Jesus as a point of departure means that Christians must understand more responsibly the context out of which the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19 to 20 was given by Jesus Christ. Indeed, the scriptural recordings of Jesus' ministry cannot be more clear in demonstrating that Christians are primarily called to find other Christological titles of Jesus Christ. That is, to identify with and liberate, actively liberate, the various oppressed peoples from which these Christological titles are derived. And to understand that, quote, the commitment of faith is to fail better at siding with the oppressed, mm. not to fail, fail better at describing the world. Y'all didn't hear me. <laughs> <laughs> the commitment of faith is to fail better at siding with the oppressed, mm. not to fail better at describing the world. Mm. Instead of calling us to continuously, and that was a quote from James Cone, instead of calling us to continuously devise new ways and laws to make the world follow our supposedly all-encompassing Christian theology. The Great Commission calls Christians to make more disciples, more followers of Christ, more liberators, who fight against the oppression of their neighbors as Christ did for them. Given then that the universal particular dialectic authorizes many liberation theologies aimed at the freeing of oppressed peoples, including but not limited to American blacks, we can, with a sense of urgency, turn to a final discussion, focus on the concept of liberation itself. What is liberation? Indeed, as we extend our theological imagination in the search for contemporary Christological titles that complement that of black Jesus, a thorough understanding of the concept of liberation is necessary to fail as best as possible in the commitment of faith. Lloyd acknowledges this necessity in his aforementioned article, in that, quote, it seems natural that black theology should open the door to myriad theological enterprises growing out of the plethora of cultural context in which Christians find themselves, end quote. Out of this recognition, then, a final question, at least for this discussion, is warranted. How can Christians be sure that they have truly found a manifestation of Christ in the least of these? Mm -hmm. That is, how can Christians be sure that a people is oppressed and that Christ has entered their historical situation in order to enact their liberation? Mm -hmm. According to Vincent Lloyd, there is an important distinction to be made between secular and theological notions of liberation. Mm -hmm. While a secular notion of liberation focuses on empirical data that point toward oppression, a theological notion of liberation, quote, speaks of a commitment not to the oppressed as judged by any empirical measure, but to those who play the role of the oppressed in the divine drama of liberation, mm -hmm. as imperfectly discerned by us fallen humans, mm -hmm. A theological approach of liberation stays connected and indeed grows out of the universal particular dialectic, mm -hmm. acknowledging that truth is both universal and particular, that the universal is inaccessible, and that the particular cannot be absolutized. <clears throat> A theological approach of liberation recognizes that if truth is Jesus Christ, and if Jesus Christ is liberation, then liberation is truth, and can thus only be found in the in-between of the universal particular dialectic. Harris, what does this mean in practice? <laughs> Lloyd's skillful analysis of Cone is helpful here, quote, is a longer quote. 
Cone notes that even when the theologian is humbled, even when the theologian realizes that her vocabulary is a human vocabulary and is always inadequate to lecture about ultimate reality, there remains a criterion by which to judge theology. It is not the suitability or the elegance of the theologian's concepts that provide this criterion. It is like Marx's 11th thesis, not how well theology describes the world that matters, but how well theology changes the world. This change takes place not in the vocabulary of the day, not in the secular vocabulary. The task before us is to affect the reevaluation of all values, to formulate a new law and a new morality that will transform humanity. It is a radical transformation, not recognizable in secular terms. As Cohn remarks, citing Kierkegaard, there are no objective scientific criteria to tell when and where God is at work in the world. And yet, for the faithful, there is absolute certainty and absolute commitment. Unquote. Christians can know when they have found a new Christological title when their acts of liberation on the behalf of oppressed peoples, liberating acts taken in risk because of the uncertainty that it is the in-between of the universal particular dialectic, demonstrate that the world has been changed for the better. So as I come to a close, I hope that this lecture has done some work to illuminate the importance of the marginalized in the story of the Bible. The nature of God is both universal and particular, and our primary revelation comes through the liberating acts of God in history especially through the lived example of Jesus Christ in the Gospels. Indeed, by explaining how Cohn understands the universal and particular, both in relation to each other and in relation to biblical revelation, I hope to have shown that any reading of Cohn as too black is simply a product of fragile white racism. Mm -hmm. Jesus was not ambiguous in telling us that he identifies himself with the least of these, mm -hmm. such that Jesus is black in America, among other descriptors. <coughs> Friends, I hope you leave here to understanding why James Cohn's black liberation theology is not overly particularistic, just because black and liberation are additions to or descriptors of the word theology. Indeed, I hope I have made it clear with Cohn that any scripture-based, Jesus-centered Christian theology should be able to be perceived as liberation theology because Christian theology is liberation theology. Thank you. Mm -hmm.